David M. Crane, and I'm a professor at Syracuse University College of Law uh, in upstate New York, and I am the former founding chief prosecutor of the International War Crimes Tribunal in West Africa called the Special Court for Sierra Leone. <laughs> Well, thank you for joining us on Africa Talks today. I really appreciate uh, for making time and sitting with me today, uh, especially last minute uh, call. So the um, first question I'd like to ask you is, international court process is often criticized for being slow and weak. And the case of Slobodan Milosevic comes to mind, uh, where uh, the accused died while still in the middle of multi-year trial. And yet, the special court in Sierra Leone, uh, prosecutors have successfully gained at least 11 convicts of top leaders. Why do you think this court has worked better, better than others? Well, we're not better than others. I think that uh, modern international criminal law is just beginning. Just 15 years ago, none of this existed. So what we're really seeing here is the beginning of the beginning. Uh, the international community, though, uh, when they created the special court for Sierra Leone, I think got a couple things right. One of which was a mandate, prosecute those who bore the greatest responsibility for war crimes and crimes against humanity for the Civil War uh, that took place in the 1990s in Sierra Leone. Uh, a workable mandate. In other words, uh, those who I had the jurisdiction to prosecute were those who created the horror story. And so that was around 20 people or less. And that, that's doable in, a, in a, a fairly short period of time. So the mandate was correct. Another thing that they did was they put the court right in the crime scene. The headquarters of the tribunal was in Freetown, Sierra Leone. So that was also important. It was much more efficient. It allowed the people to uh, see justice being done, but it also allowed us to access witnesses uh, much more quickly than if we were moved somewhere else, let's say, in The, in the Hague. So that was also uh, very, very important. Uh, another uh, thing that they did was that they made it a hybrid international war crimes tribunal, which means that we were of the UN, of the United Nations, but not in the United Nations. And the United Nations does not do a very good job as far as administrative capability. They're much slower, and this has been a challenge for the sister tribunals in Yugoslavia uh, and uh, Rwanda, where they are in the UN, and their personnel and administrative practices uh, add years to the process, whereas we could use our own personnel processes and allow us to hire people quickly to stand up and to get the work done. Oh, so the leader of Revolutionary United uh, Front, a uh, cult leader named Sam Lacquari, uh, was never tried uh, in relation to this. And uh, does it frustrate you that he never was held? account for these crimes? Well, I indicted 13 individuals yeah. for war crimes and crimes against humanity, uh, and a couple of them uh, died. Uh, one, Fodi Sanko, the uh, leader and founder of the Revolutionary United Front, died of a pulmonary embolism just after we arrested him. Uh, it was an act of, of God and nothing we could do about it. Uh, Samuel Balkri, though, uh, was murdered by a another indictee, the sitting president of Liberia, Charles Taylor, uh, and uh, had him murdered and then uh, shipped him back to me in a box uh, on my birthday. And so it shows kind of the, the type of environment and type of individual that Charles Taylor was. But Charles Taylor killed Samuel Balkery, uh and did it intentionally. Uh, to avoid Samuel Bakary and his family talking about the complicity of Charles Taylor. Now, sadly, also, is he not just killed Samuel Bakary, but he also killed Samuel Bakary's family, uh, his wife, his three children, and uh, his mother. So that's a story that's not been told. But uh, uh, would I have liked to have prosecuted Samuel Bakary fairly and openly in a, in a public trial for what he had done to Sierra Leone? And the answer is, of course, I would have. Uh, but Charles Taylor chose to murder him. Was he sending a message to you? Uh, I'm not sure what he was doing, uh, but the bottom line was is that uh, Charles Taylor plays hardball. Uh, he's basically a warlord and a thug, and the guise of the sitting president of an African nation. 
Uh, but in reality, he's just a common criminal. And uh, we investigated him, indicted him, and now he is about his trials ending. The defense finished their case this week, coincidentally. And uh, now the tribunal will return his guilt or innocence. And should he be found guilty, he'll spend the rest of his life in a prison in Great Britain. Okay, now I'm going to move to uh, the documentary, How War Done Now, um, which follows the trial of Issa mm -hmm. You play a central role in the proceedings. Mm -hmm. Sase is now serving a 52-year prison sentence in Rwanda. Please explain to who Sase is and why his trial is so important and why do you think he played such an important role as second in command? Well, he was the battle group commander of the infamous Revolutionary United Front. He was second in command only to uh, Fodi Sanko, who was the founder. So he prosecuted the war for uh, almost a full decade. And as a result of his policies and his generalship, uh, tens of thousands of his fellow citizens were horribly murdered, raped, maimed. The, the Revolutionary United Front are the individuals who cut body parts off arms, legs, lips, buttocks, breasts, ears, uh, noses, uh, just because they could. So uh, Isis Sese was one of the key individuals that uh, uh, I sought to investigate, uh, to indict, and prosecute uh, on behalf of the Sierra Leonean people. He was clearly uh, very much the center point uh, uh, and one of the key leaders of the Revolutionary United Front who bore the greatest responsibility for war crimes and crimes against humanity. Uh, and so justice was done. Uh, he did horrible things to his country, to his people, uh, and he certainly deserved uh, the 52 years that he was given for being fairly and openly uh, convicted uh, before the tribunal. Well, uh, in the film, I uh, remember uh, it, it was the, the, the local people gathering uh, around televisions to watch the proceedings. Mm -hmm. uh, do you feel the local people of Sierra Leone felt connected to the process, or did they understand the process at all? Well, it wasn't perfect, but uh, what we did was uh, the very first month that I was there, I started uh, what was called the town hall program, where I literally walked the countryside for four months listening to the people of Sierra Leone tell me what took place in Sierra Leone listening to them. For three years, I went back and talked to them and listened to them. So they were connected, and we had a wonderful outreach program uh, that centered in the registry, which is the clerk of the court. But we were always up country, talking and listening to the people as to what their concerns were about the court, answering their questions and getting their feedback. So it was very, very important, and I think it was one of the more success stories of the tribunal, and that was reaching out to the people of Sierra Leone and keeping them informed about their court, the special court for Sierra Leone. Uh, there were also uh, uh, much made uh, in the film uh, by your counterparts on the defense about the prosecutor's ability to pay witness large sums of money in exchange for testimony. Uh, tell us how that worked and why you believe it is necessary and ethical. Well, one is we didn't pay uh, witnesses large sums of money. What we did was to ensure that they arrived at the court uh, in one piece uh, and that they were put up in a, an appropriate place, a safe place, a safe house where they would be protected. Because again, uh, you have to understand that this was a, uh, a very, very a delicate place. The witnesses uh, had to be protected. Uh, but we don't pay witnesses for their testimony. What we did is provide them travel money, food money, and a place to stay, and protection. And we did this mainly through what we call our witness management program. Uh, you know, I have an ethical obligation to, if I ask you to testify, to protect you. I want you to tell the truth and nothing but the truth. But I have an obligation to protect you to ensure that you and your family are not intimidated or in some cases injured or killed. So our witness management program, which was very much something that we put in place that mirrored what goes on in the United States, uh, well, what is is that uh, it's unethical to pay witnesses. We don't pay witnesses for their testimony. What we do is we protect witnesses and we provide witnesses, like any jurisdiction does, the ability to come and to testify. And so we, uh, the court itself, not the prosecutor, pays for their travel, 
um, and uh, takes care of their food and provides them a safe place to stay during their testimony. And we did this through our witness management program. I have an ethical obligation to ensure that they're protected. So uh, it's not true uh, and uh, that we paid any witnesses. It's, it's not appropriate. We wanted to make sure that the witnesses got there uh, in good health, uh, they felt safe, and they felt at ease to tell their horror stories about what Isis Esse and his henchmen did uh, to the people. I was very impressed with the people of Sierra Leone. We had over 350 witnesses, and they all came and um, testified about what took place uh, in, in Sierra Leone and testified uh, by the dozens against Isis Esse and his henchmen. And they did a fair job, they told the truth, uh, and then we took them home back to their, their villages. Well, thank you for that explanation. Um, how have you seen Sierra Leone change from the time the special courts first convened uh, until today? And uh, is, is it more a peaceful place? Or is there a chance for war to reignite? Well, I think that uh, the special court for Sierra Leone showed them that the rule of law is more powerful than the rule of the gun. And that's important uh, for the people to see that. And instead of picking up the gun, they pick up the rule of law. I think that it has provided some stability, but again, uh, the justice portion of the rehabilitation and the transition of Sierra Leone from war to peace uh, is just a part of a long process. It'll take an entire generation for that country to come back uh, and to be able to be a prosperous member of, uh, of the family of nations because it was totally destroyed. When I, was when I arrived there in 2002, 90% of the country was completely destroyed. You know, imagine the entire city, or the, actually the entire state of Missouri destroyed. All of the roads, no electricity, no running water, judiciary collapsed, no public services, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, it's going to take them a long time, uh, but we have shown that those who commit horror stories like uh, uh, the individuals that I indicted, 13 individuals who bore the greatest responsibility, will be will be held accountable. And so that uh, the individuals who think about doing something like this again, I think will be deterred. But it remains to be seen. I'm not saying that uh, we have saved a nation. I think we've shown a nation that the rule of law uh, can bring peace. What do you see for the future of uh, Sierra Leone in general? Well, I am hopeful, uh, but I am a little bit uh, skeptical. Uh, so much can happen, but I think that uh, uh, there's a possibility that Sierra Leone uh, will move into the future a, a little bit brighter uh, with a lot of chance of succeeding. They just held uh, an election where there wasn't a shot fired uh, and that we have a, a new president uh, from the opposition. Uh, there was a peaceful transition and that's a good thing, uh, particularly for Sierra Leone. And so we'll see. It remains to be seen, uh, but I think that the special court for Sierra Leone helped uh, and put them on a path where they might succeed. Is there any, is there any message you'd like to give uh, out to anybody who would, who would watch this in terms of the peaceful process of implementing the rule of law? Well, as I told the people of Sierra Leone in my town hall program, is that uh, no one is above the law, uh, that the law is fair, and that the rule of law is more powerful uh, than the rule of the gun. And I think that they began to understand that, and I think that based on those particular principles, uh, they're not going to allow and stand for uh, some thug or some diamond dealer or some cynical warlord to take over their country again. They know that the rule of law uh, will brighten their future. Well, thank you for sitting with us. Thank you, my pleasure. Here is a look at a new segment, Africa Talks Back. It is a special segment where you, the viewer, or anyone interested in Africa Talks, is invited to call in and share thoughts, give feedback on previous shows, and talk about what you would like to watch on the show and ask questions. Here is a short preview of viewers who called all the way from Serbia, London, Norway, and all over the United States through Skype. For future shows, you have ideas or questions and feedback, you can also email me at salem.salomon at columbiaaccess.tv.
calling from Columbia, Missouri. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much for calling and uh, joining us at the show. Have you been watching Africa Talks lately? Well, I've just begun to watch it. Um, I watch segments of a couple of shows, and I really want to watch more of it. So I'm very excited about it. So what would you think uh, would be interesting for other people to uh, watch it and learn from it? What would you suggest? Well, I'll tell you from my personal experience, I have been meeting and working with many refugees from Rwanda. And I am amazed at what they have gone through and what their life experience has been in Rwanda. Yeah. And many of them were from Gatumba, which is the refugee camp where many people were slaughtered. Um, it's just uh, their histories and their, their stories are just amazing that they have survived. And it's also amazing to me that most Americans don't know anything about that. Oh. So I think um, we all need to be more educated about what's going on in the rest of the world and some of the, the troubles that people are having and what the situation is for refugees who come here and how difficult it is for them to learn a whole new language and try to fit into a whole new culture and to deal with the depression yeah. and the post-traumatic stress that they have from all the terrible events that they've had. So uh, we need more understanding, you know, between us. As, even though the show is on Africa and everything, I think there are a lot of relevant facts outside of Africa that still influence many things that happen and a lot of decisions that happen in Africa. So I would like um, them incorporated in the show as well to consider, you know, a bigger picture. I, I found it very interesting and uh, informative, especially for uh, people who are not very familiar with things African and Africans, and uh, also for uh, Africans in, in the U.S., it might also be helpful and informative about possibilities in, in Africa. For example, it would be very interesting to talk to people who can speak about the challenges of integration, you know, in, in terms of culture, uh, social practices and things like that and also a self-advancement if you will like uh, how to get jobs how to do applications for certain things like scholarships not very many people readily know about those things so it would be helpful I think Uh, I'm calling from uh, Serbia and from the second largest city in uh, Serbia in Europe. Uh, the name of the city is Novi Sad. Oh, okay. Thank you for joining us. Have you been watching Africa Talks uh, from the past uh, recordings? Uh, yeah, I saw a couple of uh, broadcasts of Africa Talks. Uh, I saw it today, actually, uh, because I'm not in Colombia, but of course I'm really happy that I can see it uh, online and I enjoyed it really much. What would you like to see on the show in the future? What would you like to learn about Africa or Africans in general? Uh, well, you know, uh, where I come from, uh, Africa is something uh, which is not a very well-known subject. Uh, people around here don't know much uh, except from that Africa is far away and there are some people over there and that they have AIDS and that there are some hundred children in Africa. Yeah. Uh, so I think that uh, creating the image uh, of Africa in the local communities it is really important because there is much more than that in Africa and I think that getting to know some really quality people and uh, some things which are happening over there and uh, getting the impression that it's not uh, like a continent which is far away and uh, kind of a bad things are happening, but we just, you know, count them. That's the wrong thing, and I think that your, sh your show is helping people to uh, feel it and see it differently. I'm calling from Norway, Oslo. 
The, prob the big problem is this, uh, the language. Most Africans have the better because uh, it's another, another, another language, so another culture, another... Uh, Everything is different, so for Africans it's a little bit uh, difficult uh, uh, to integrate. Uh, you, you guys are doing good. Uh, I hope you will do it better and uh, more coverage of uh, another topics, like uh, integrating to the society. I'm just saying that uh, you guys are doing great. Um. More presentation of you know uh, Africans like students uh, that are doing better, they are doing good, they are uh, providing you know, something for the country and also doing something back home too. What would you think would be best to uh, educate people? Normally, I give them like uh, different websites or recommend them uh, some books uh, and just not to you know to believe whatever they see on TV. Yeah. Because, uh, for example, one of my co-workers, they still think um, Ethiopia is uh, really backwards. They, they, they didn't believe me. They have like uh, cars, uh, buildings, high-rising buildings. Yeah. So, just to give them some, you know, information, just search it, uh, do some, you know, uh, readings, go online, and just, you know, things like that. I'm calling from uh, KOPN, downtown Columbia. Uh, I think it's important to bring that kind of information uh, to Columbia. I, mean, I don't think that uh, we get enough of that, uh, what's really happening uh, around the world, really, not just Africa. And uh, so, uh, you know, I re appreciate what you do. It's, it's great work. So you think uh, the community here in Columbia could learn from the show? Oh, absolutely. I have uh, a couple of friends that are from... Uh, Rwanda and the Congo, and just being able to talk to them, it opens up the whole world. So it's a, it's a, it's need to have different perspectives. I mean, I, I think I like the the international take on it. Yet at the same time, uh, maybe some you know local uh, local people, voices. Which, yeah, which you're already I think kind of doing. I mean, you're doing a great job. So uh, what about uh, KOPN? Do you guys have uh, do you incorporate uh, shows that are uh, including African music? Uh? Oh, absolutely. Uh, Morgan Matsiga does uh, our um, Motherland Jam, which is uh, music from all over the continent of Africa. So, yeah, that's noon at Saturdays. Oh, my name is um, Chimereze OG. I go by OG for short, and I'm a student. I'm a student in the University of Missouri, Columbia. I'm studying mechanical engineering. On Africa Talk, I would like to see more about Africa, try to expose people, try to let people know how Africa is going, how Africa is moving as a whole, because there are 54 countries in Africa, so there's a lot of, there's a lot of information out there that can be known to the people in America, basically. I grew up in Nigeria, so like, I don't run away from my ethnicity, basically. My both parents are Nigerians, is from one tribe, so I really don't run away from it. So I try to like educate people like if they ask me random questions about, oh, how's Africa? Oh, how's this? Oh, is this how they dress? Is this how they look? I try to educate them from like time to time basis. Most people think that Africa is not really developed and everything. So like you get comments like, um, do we wear clothes? Or wow, do you guys drive nice cars? Or are there nice houses there? And I give them back. I'm like, yeah, there's nice houses. Actually, I used to drive a nice car. Better the car I drive over here. So, like, just educate them more and let them know that, like, Africa is not the Africa you see on TV. Some of the things I would like to see from the show in the future is, like, maybe some upcoming African artists in the, in the local area because, like, they're Africans everywhere. To try to, like, expose them and see whether, they're, like, they're really interested and, in, like, like, try to expose them basically and get them out there. I let everybody know, oh, okay, we have this people, we have this artist right here. So, like, in case we're having shows or we're trying to hold a pageant or we're trying to hold an event, we know who to contact. We're like, okay, yeah, we can get this African Africans in the local area to perform. That's one of the things I would like to see on the show. Well, so far it is uh, kind of good, but uh, there's always room for improvement, right? Um, 
I think like it would be so much better and interactive. Like if you guys uh, can make it like a little bit uh, real. I mean, going out into the field and you know, like uh, showing more good about the what other Africans are doing, and especially like regarding culture or it could be like in terms of education or something like that. Like I think you guys could do a lot better go into educational stuff like there are a lot of people that are doing real groundbreaking research or medicine and things like that you know so you can start from the culture and then go from there and then like see different angles into where uh, the good side of Africa can come. Uh, where I am right now is like Southern Illinois University it's like more diverse and it has like a lot of different cultures and there's like a, the African community which ha, which holds like once per year like a big culture even for a week so that's like it feels like more home like you know you have your food your dances and fashion shows and stuff that goes around so it's like more of like you know uh, diverse so that gives room for other opinions and cultural mix and stuff so that's a little bit great yeah but also, like, it needs a lot of awareness. I mean, people usually assume Africa as a country, right? So that shows you, like, many people are not aware of what kind of languages or different cultures are around. And I think, like, uh, they could do a lot better on that aspect. And, of course, as Africa is known, like, for being, like, a continent of war and other stuff so that's the perspective but there's also the good part on it so i think like there's a lot to be done on that aspect but people seem to be aware a lot about it here and that was all we had for you for today thank you for watching this is africa talks <laughs>